Chapter 44 of Colonel Quaritch, V.C. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Colonel Quaritch, V.C. by H. Ryder Haggart. Chapter 44 Christmas Chimes. The squire turned and entered the house. He generally was fairly noisy in his movements, but on this occasion he was exceptionally so. Possibly he had a reason for it. On reaching the vestibule he found Harold and Ida standing side by side as though they were being drilled. It was impossible to resist the conclusion that they had suddenly assumed that attitude because it happened to be the first position into which they could conveniently fall. There was a moment's silence and then Harold took Ida's hand and led her up to where her father was standing. Mr. de la Mole, he said simply, once more, I ask you for your daughter in marriage. I am quite aware of my many disqualifications, especially those of my age and the smallness of my means. But Ida and myself hope and believe that under all the circumstances you will no longer withhold your consent. And he paused. Quaritch, answered the squire, I have already in your presence told Mr. Cossey under what circumstances I was favorably inclined to his proposal so I need not repeat all that. As regards your means, although they would have been quite insufficient to avert the ruin which threatened us, still you have, I believe, a competence, and owing to your wonderful and most providential discovery, the fear of ruin seems to have passed away. It is owing to you that discovery, which, by the way, I want to hear all about, has been made. Had it not been for you, it never would have been made at all, and therefore I certainly have no right to say anything more about your means. As regards your age, well, after all, forty-four is not the limit of life, and if Ida does not object to marrying a man of those years, I cannot object to her doing so. With reference to your want of occupation, I think that if you marry Ida, this place will, as times are, keep your hands pretty full, especially when you have an obstinate donkey like that fellow George to deal with, for I am getting too old and stupid to look after it myself, and besides... Things are so topsy-turvy that I can't understand them. There is one thing more that I want to say to you. I forbade you the house. Well, you are a generous-minded man, and it is human to err, and I think that perhaps you will understand my actions and not bear me a grudge on that account. Also, I dare say that at the time, and possibly at other times, I said things that I should be sorry for if I could remember what they were, which I can't. And if so, I apologize to you as a gentleman should when he finds himself in the wrong. And now I say, God bless you both, and hope you will be happy in life together. And so come here, Ida, my love, and give me a kiss. You have been a good daughter all your life, and so Quaritch may be sure that you will be a good wife too. Ida did as she was bid, and then she went over to her lover and took his hand, and he kissed her on the forehead. And so, after all their troubles, they finally ratified the contract. And we, who have followed them thus far, have perhaps been a little moved by their struggles, hopes, and fears. We'll not surely grudge to re-echo the squire's old-fashioned prayer. God bless them both. God bless them both. Long may they live, and happily. Long may they live, and for very long may their children's children of the race, if not of the name of de la Mole, pass in and through the old Norman gateway, and past the sturdy Norman towers. The Boises who built them, here, had their habitation for six generations. The de la Moles, who wedded the heiress of the Boises, lived here for thirteen generations. May the Quaritches, whose ancestor married Ida, heiress of the de la Moles, endure as long. Surely it is permitted to us to lift a corner of the curtain of futurity to see, in spirit, Ida Quaritch, stately and beautiful as we know her, but of a happier countenance, seated on some Christmas Eve to come, in the drawing-room of the castle, and telling to the children at her knees the wonderful tale of how their father and old George, on this very night, when the great gale blew, long years ago, discovered the ruddy pile of gold, hoarded in that awful storehouse, amid the bones of Saxon or Danish heroes, and thus saved her to be their mother. We can surely see the wide and wondering eyes and the fixed faces as for the tenth time they listen to a story before which the joys of Crusoe will grow pale. 
and hear the eager appeals for confirmation made to the military-looking gentleman, very grizzled now, but grown better looking with the advancing years, who is standing warming himself before the fire, the best and most beloved husband and father in the whole countryside. Perhaps there may be a vacant chair and another tomb among the ranks of the departed de la Moles. Perhaps the ancient walls will no longer echo to the sound of the old squire's stentorian voice. And what of that? It is our common lot. But when he goes, the countryside will lose a man of whom they will not see the like again, for the breed is dead or dying. A man whose very prejudices, inconsistencies, and occasional wrong-headed violence will be held when he is no longer here to have been endearing qualities, and for manliness, for downright English God-fearing virtues, for love of queen, country, family, and home, they may search in vain to find his equal among the thin-blooded gentility of the cosmopolitan Englishman of the dawning twentieth century. His faults were many, and at one time he went near to sacrificing his daughter to save his house, but he would not have been the man he was without them. And so to him, too, farewell. Perhaps he will find himself a better place in the Valhalla of his forefathers, surrounded by those stout old de la Moles, whose memory he regarded with so much affection, than here in the Victorian era. For as has been said elsewhere, the old squire would undoubtedly have looked better in a chain shirt and a battle axe than ever he did in a frock coat, especially with his retainer George armed to the teeth behind him. They kissed, and it was done, and out from the church tower in the meadows broke with a clash and clangor the glad sound of the Christmas bells. Out it swept, over piddle and fallow, over grove and wood. It floated down the valley of the L. It beat against dead man's mount, henceforth to the vulgar mind more haunted than ever, and echoed up the castle's Norman towers and down the oak-clad vestibule. Away over the common went the glad message of Earth's Saviour, away high into the air, startling the rooks upon their airy courses, as though the iron notes of the world's rejoicing would fain float to the throned feet of the world's everlasting King. Peace and good will, ay, happiness to the children of men while their span is, and hope for the beyond, and heaven's blessing on holy love and all good things that are. This was what those liquid notes seemed to say to the most happy pair who stood hand in hand in the vestibule and thought of all they had escaped and all they had won. Well, Quaritch, if you and Ida have quite done staring at each other, which isn't very interesting to a third party, perhaps you will not mind telling us how you happened on old Sir James de la Mole's hoard. Thus adjured, Harold began his thrilling story, telling the whole history of the night in detail, and if his hearers had expected to be astonished, certainly their expectations were considerably more than fulfilled. "'Upon my word,' said the squire when he had done, "'I think I am beginning to grow superstitious in my old age. Hang me if I don't believe it was the finger of Providence itself that pointed out those letters to you.' Anyway, I am off to see the spoil. Run and get your hat, Ida, my dear, and we will all go together. And they went and looked at the chest, brimful of red gold, yes, and passed down, all three of them, into those chill presences in the bowels of the mount, and, coming thence, odd and silent, sealed up the place forever. End of chapter 44 Conclusion Goodbye on the following morning, such inhabitants of Boisingham as happened to be about were much interested at seeing an ordinary farm tromble coming down the main street, and being driven, or rather led, by no less a person than George himself, while behind it walked the well-known form of the old squire, arm in arm with Colonel Quaritch. They were still more interested, however, when the tumble drew up at the door of the bank, not Causey's, but the opposition bank, where, although it was Boxing Day, the manager and the clerk were waiting, apparently for its coming. But their interest culminated when they perceived that the cart only contained a few flour sacks, and yet that each of these sacks seemed to require three or four men to lift it without any comfort. 
Thus the gold was safely housed. Upon being weighed, its value was found to be about fifty-three thousand pounds of modern money. As, however, some of the coins were exceedingly rare and of great value to museums and collectors, this value was considerably increased, and the treasure was ultimately sold for fifty-five thousand two hundred and fifty-four pounds. Only Ida kept back enough of the choicest coins to make a gold waistband or girdle and a necklace for herself. Destined, no doubt, in future days, to form the most cherished heirloom of the Quaritch family. On that same evening, the squire and Harold went to London and opened up communications with the solicitor to the treasury. Fortunately, they were able to refer to the will of Sir Edward de la Mole, the second baronet, in which he specially devised to his cousin Geoffrey Dofferley and his heirs for ever, not only his estates but his lands, together with the treasure. Hidden thereon or elsewhere by my late murdered father, Sir James de la Mole. Also, they produced the writing which Ida had found in the old Bible and the parchment discovered by George among the coin. These three documents formed a chain of evidence which even officials interested for the treasury could not refuse to admit. And in the upshot, the crown renounced its claims, and the property in the gold passed to the squire. Subject to the payment of the same succession duty, which he would have been called upon to meet had he inherited a like sum from a cousin at the present time, and so it came to pass that when the mortgage money was due, it was paid to the last farthing, capital and interest, and Edward Cossey lost his hold upon Honham for ever. As for Edward Cossey himself, we may say one more word about him. In the course of time, he got over his violent passion for Ida sufficiently to allow him to make a brilliant marriage with the only daughter of an impecunious peer. She keeps her name and title, and he plays the part of the necessary husband. Anyhow, my reader, if it is your glorious fortune to frequent the gilded saloons of the great, you may meet Lady Honoria Talbot and Mister Cossey. If you do meet him, however, it may be well to avoid him, for the events of his life have not been of a nature to improve his temper. This much then of Edward Cossey. If after leaving the gilded saloons aforesaid you should happen to wander down Piccadilly or the Strand, as the case may be, you may meet another character in this history. You may see a sweet, pale face, still stamped with a childlike roundness and simplicity. But half hidden in the coarse hood of the nun, you may see her, and if you care to follow, you may find what is the work wherein she seeks her peace. It would shock you; you would fly from it in horror. But in her work of mercy and loving kindness, and she does it unflinchingly, and among her fellow nuns there is no one more beloved than Sister Agnes. So good bye to her also. Harold Quaritch and Ida were married in the spring. And the village children strewed the churchyard path, the same path where, in anguish of soul, they had met and parted on that dreary winter's night, with primroses and violets. And there, at the old church door, when the wreath is on her brow and the veil about her face, let us bid farewell to Ida and her husband Harold Quaritch. The end. End of conclusion. End of Colonel Quaritch, V.C. by H. Ryder Haggard, read by Esther.